So my essential problem is the following, change the variables chi i tilde to the first order and then calculate this Lagrangian change at the first order and make it equal to 0. So you all, all, all of you agree now. So my essential way of doing it would be change all chi i tilde from the original chi i tilde plus delta chi i tilde. So this is my new new value, let us say chi i tilde n and then I calculate delta L tilde, ok. So, delta L tilde is nothing but first order change. So, this is first order change in the Lagrange. and put it equal to 0. So, you all agree that this is the first order change, right. So, this is basically doing the derivative equal to 0. So, I do not have to consider second order change and then divide by delta chi i tilde and then limit. So, all that I do not need to take. It is a very simple thing. So, just make each of the chi i tilde change to first order and then calculate the first order change in delta, the change from the origin and make it equal to 0. Is it clear to everybody? So, that will be basically doing the variation and of course, now I will have to go through the algebra what the first order change means. So, that will go slowly. Note again, there are two kinds of chi i tilde, one on the left, one on the right, everywhere. So, I have basically chi i tildes as well as chi i star tildes, correct? Now, the question is, do I need to change both of them? The answer is no. Because they are complex conjugates, I can only change one of them. Let us say complex conjugate of the chi i, so left one and then find out what is delta n tilde and make it equal to 0 because the other one will be simply complex conjugate of this. So, I do not need to do it twice. So, I can only change the chi i tilde left side. So, basically I am changing chi i tilde star. So, that is easy to chop off from the left side. There is no particular reason to choose left side, I can make right side. So, eventually I am going to make each of the left chi i star from chi i tilde star to delta chi i tilde star, first order change and see what happens to the delta i. So, I think you can now do this. Of course, when I am changing chi i star, remember the chi i is also changing, obviously, because I cannot change only the complex conjugate and not this, because this, they are conjugate to each other. So, both of them are changing to the first order. So, let us now write down what happens as a result of the change, all right. So, let me first do the first term, first term is very easy, fairly easy. So, let us do the first term, remember I am changing each of the chi i tilde. So, what happens for the delta L tilde, for the first term, so this is only the first term in that expression. So, what would be the result? It will be sum over i, remember I am writing delta, so I am going to subtract this term for this term. So, I will now take only first order. So, first order will be delta chi i tilde on the left, h chi i. Is there any more term? Yes, plus chi i tilde h delta chi i tilde, sorry tilde. That is all. Do you agree? Because of course, I will have another term where both of them are delta chi i tilde but that is second order. So, I will not consider. So, delta L tilde because of this change will have one side delta chi i tilde, another side just chi i tilde, L chi i tilde delta chi i. Because when I am changing either one of them, the other one also will change. So, the first order change of chi i delta L tilde for this term is can be written very simply. Yeah, it will have an effect, but we are taking orders of only delta first order in delta, whatever is the delta we define. So, Hamiltonian, please remember the small h does not have chi. So, when I am changing chi, the Hamiltonian does not change, the physical Hamiltonian does not have chi. So, the small h is a one particle operator, so that will be constant. So, that is why there is no change here 
and of course this h will act on that actual integral simply means one particular integral so you don't have to bother this is a function this is a function integral of course this function is not equal to this one these are change very small function and there is an operator this one so it's a one particle so the, for example this one is nothing but chi i star whatever is the dummy variable r h of r delta chi i so that is that is this integral so these integrals can be trivially done actually i have not defined what is delta chi remember and it's not important to define you will see the later but it is just a first order change assume whatever is the first order change ah. so note also when i when i did this problem remember this first order change is for any delta x so it is an arbitrary delta x so this change that we are we are defining here is for an arbitrary delta x i am not defining even delta x any arbitrary delta x delta x so that will anyway cancel out when you do dy dx okay so i did this now let me go back to the second term the second term is fairly complex as you can see first of all the second term has two terms it is not one term it is a coulomb and the exchange term so let me write down delta l tilde and let us let me call this term 2a so 2a is essentially the coulomb term for the second term. so if i write this you will get half of sum over ij so you have the coulomb term and i have to take the first order of the coulomb term so remember there is a 1 by r onto here so i am going to now write it explicitly so I have a delta chi i tilde, this should now remain chi j tilde, 1 by r12 chi i tilde, chi j tilde, agree? This is the first term. Then I can change chi j tilde, because remember this is for all chi i, a dummy variable. So, so there will be another term which will be chi i tilde, delta chi j tilde, 1 by r12 chi i tilde, chi j tilde. Further, there will be a third term which is chi i tilde, chi j tilde, 1 by r12, delta chi i tilde, chi j tilde. And there is a fourth term which is chi i tilde, chi j tilde, 1 by r12, chi i tilde, delta chi tilde. I think all of you can write it very easily. So, for, for original integral, this is chi i tilde, chi j tilde, 1 by r12, chi i tilde, chi j tilde. Okay. You are just changing each of these four one at a time because everything is first order. So I can't have any any two changes plugged in. So I'll have only one change at a time. Is it clear? That's the Coulomb part. Then comes the exchange part, which is which is more difficult to write. Simply because I have I have to switch this. Okay. Eventually, of course, I have to switch this. So, chi j tilde 1 by r onto chi j tilde chi j tilde. So, I can write this delta L tilde to B. So, I have to be just careful. So, this should be equal to half of delta chi i tilde chi j tilde. So, same terms I am writing, rewriting it again 1 by r 1 2, except that the right hand side will now all change chi j tilde chi j tilde plus delta chi i tilde, chi j tilde, chi i tilde, delta chi j tilde, 1 by r 1, chi j tilde, chi i tilde, and so on. You can write this, all these terms. I am just writing it, but it is very easy. And to a point that it is quite boring actually. Okay. And hence the fourth term. I should just write with a minus sign. Whole thing is minus. Okay. So for everything, I've just exchanged the right side. And since this comes with a negative sign, I have to make minus for everything. So this up to here. Uh, actually, let me put this outside. It should be minus half. Okay. Half also multiplies it. So, minus half of all these things. Do you agree? 
So you have the delta L1, delta L2A, delta L2B, and finally, of course, this one, last one, delta L3. So let me write this down as well. So delta L3 equal to minus, I put a minus, sum over ij, and then I had a lambda ij, which is just a number times delta chi i tilde chi j tilde plus chi i tilde delta chi. Right? Of course, the first order change to this quantity, lambda ij into delta ij is 0. So, I am not writing, I am writing the chain because that is a constant. Chronical delta is a constant. This is also a constant. So, I am not writing this minus delta ij because we are writing only the change. Okay? So, that will anyway get cancelled, whatever is constant. Is it okay? So, now I have got everything in, in, the, in place. So, I can write down the entire delta L except that there are too many terms. That is the only problem, spe specifically because of 2a and 2b. And uh, so, we will try to look at this term little bit more carefully and try to analyze this. Okay. The first set of terms and the third set of terms are fairly straightforward. You have this, this, this and this. Out of which, if you notice, this term and this term are complex conjugate of each other. I hope you can see that. So, if I take conjugate of this term, what will happen? How do I take conjugate? This one will become the left vector. H is a Hermitian operator. So, it will remain same and this left vector will now go to the right. I hope all of you remember how to take matrix element. Conjugate. So, if I have an operator A and if I have a F phi and psi, what is the conjugate? Conjugate is nothing but psi, a dagger phi in general and for Hermitian operator, psi a phi, right? Okay, so just remember this, how to take matrix element function. Just take the conjugate from right to left and put it down for Hermitian operator, of course, you have a special simplification. So, you can you can notice that this part and this part are conjugates, complex conjugates of each other. If you do the same exercise, you can clearly, here it is more difficult to see because here there is a sum over i in both. Uh, I hope, I hope it is clear that the sum over i in both. When I do it here, it is little bit more difficult because this is delta chi i chi j, this is chi i delta chi j. So, by by itself, this is not a conjugate of this. Yes. However, there is a summation over all ij, dummy index. If I take the entire summation, then the sum of these and sum of these are conjugate each other because I can interchange the dummy index. I hope all of you understand. If not, I will pause a minute to get that point very clear. So, so essentially what we are doing is the following that I have a set which is sum over i j lambda i j delta chi i tilde chi j tilde and then I have another term which is sum over i j lambda i j chi i tilde delta chi i So, I have to show that this is conjugate of this. Before I do that, let me also mention a very important part that the Lagrangian by which I am starting, the, uh, the original Lagrangian, just like the energy, is of course Hermitian. It has to be Hermitian. So that is one of the important con constraints that I will have because the energy has to be Hermitian. Eventually, I am going to calculate energy. So my Lagrangian has to be Hermitian. So one of these constraints is. Because of this, you have to see that the lambda is a Hermitian matrix. Of course, if it is a real, then it is very easy. It is a symmetric matrix, otherwise lambda has to be Hermitian. I hope that is very clear because you look at the Lagrangian. What was the Lagrangian? This part? This part was ij, lambda ij, chi i tilde, chi j tilde, minus delta i. So, that was my 
if this has to be Hermitian, so you can see that I can always interchange this part for a dummy variable, no problem. But when I interchange ij, this lambda will become lambda j dagger, right? So unless this is Hermitian, the whole thing will not be Hermitian. So right away we have we have, we have a situation that to start with, my lambda is a Hermitian matrix. If lambda is a Hermitian matrix, it is easy to show that this is conjugate of this. Now normally lambda is just a real matrix; it's actually symmetric. It's not even you know, Hermitian is really uh, pushing it too far because these are all called real numbers in actual cases. So they are actually real symmetric matrices. So you can see what happens now. If I take a conjugate of ij, lambda ij, delta chi i t, tilde chi j tilde star. So if I take a star of this, what will happen? I am taking a star of the entire summation, not each star. So what will happen? This will give me sum over ij lambda ij star delta chi i uh, sorry chi j star delta chi correct just as as it as it as it occurs chi j sorry chi j delta chi chi j star is not necessary chi j delta chi then i interchange the dummy variable call i to j j to i so this remains sum over i j and if I interchange dummy variable, this becomes lambda ji, which is actually same as lambda ij, if they are real number, otherwise it's a Hermitian matrix. So I get the same thing, lambda ij, and this then becomes chi i delta chi. Okay, which is exactly the same as this. So the conjugate of this term after summing is equal to this term after summing. Is it clear? Because of the fact that the lambda is a Hermitian matrix or a real matrix. So if I if I if somebody asks you to prove that these are conjugate, you should be able to prove very, very clearly. Okay. So first, first part of the proof is that since L is lambda is Hermitian, L is Hermitian, this lambda is a Hermitian matrix. So this is where it starts. And then, then it is very easy to show that the, these two terms are conjugate of each other. So I have a situation in the delta L A. Delta L1 and delta L3 is that I have two sets of terms which are conjugate of each other. So that's important to remember that I don't have to write. I can simply say, I can simply say that this, this plus complex conjugate. Similarly, this plus com complex conjugate, CC. See, CC is essentially a short form of complex conjugate. I don't have to write. Then we come down to the analysis of 2A and 2B, which actually has a, lo a large set of terms. So we have to analyze this. Now, if you look at this set of terms, we have to see whether there is a conjugate which exists here. If you take the conjugate of this term, what will you get? You will get chi j chi i, correct? On the left, 1 by r12 chi j delta chi i, which is actually same as one of the terms, right? Either of these, doesn't matter because again there is a dummy variable ij. The same, same exercise I can do. And I can show that these two terms and these two terms are conjugate of each other. I hope all of you will be able to show this exactly in the same manner because of dummy variable interchange, i and j, they would be conjugate to each other. And in the same manner, the 2b also has two sets of terms that this set is a conjugate of these two terms. So, what is interesting is that the entire thing can be written as a set of half of the terms plus complex. Is it clear? Okay, so let me now try to write down the delta L in this manner. So I will only write the half set of terms. So I won't write the entire set of terms. And for the sake of sake of uh, consistency, that half set will always contain the change on the left side. Okay. So the first set is delta chi i tilde h chi i sum over i. I am going to put the complex conjugate later for all terms. So I am not writing this. Then I go back to 2a and I write this as a half of ij delta chi i tilde chi j tilde 1 by r12 chi i tilde chi j tilde. And then the second term, sorry, the second term 
I am only going to write these two terms now. However, I want to write, I will write. The second term is chi i tilde delta chi j tilde 1 by r12 chi i tilde chi j tilde. I don't I don't choose to write it like this. What I will do, I will make a further dummy variable interchange here. I will make this i, I will make this j deliberately. So then this will then become plus delta chi i tilde. Sorry, this tilde is I am forgetting sometimes. Chi j tilde 1 by r12 chi i tilde. Okay. So, these two sets of terms and then I will have the exchange similarly. So, you can write down the exchange similarly as delta chi i tilde. So, just do the exchange here chi j tilde 1 by r 1 chi j tilde chi i tilde and then uh, minus half. Yeah, it is better to write each of them separately because again I want to make sure that this Interchange is possible only over the entire sum, not for each ig. So that is the reason I am writing it separately for the time being. Delta chi i tilde, chi j tilde, 1 by r1, chi j tilde, minus sum over ij, lambda ij, delta chi i tilde, chi j tilde. That is it. And then I just say that whatever it is plus complex function. All the terms into a constant. Is it okay? With the sum over i, I can actually. I am actually allowed to write this, that is important when I do a sum over. Now, there is, there is, of course, I am going to make it 0, equal to 0. What was the reason I did this? You know, why did I make such a tweaking that I did not want delta here? The reason is, if I have this, I can apply a very simple rule, which I will tell you now. So, no, if I do this sum, it will be identical. It's only for not for h each, each ij. So please do that sum. Ajah, the, way, the reason I want to write is the following: that let's say I have an equation which is delta chi i star, and blah blah everything is there. Something is there. Integral is equal to zero. You know something is here. Don't have to bother. Some function of whatever. If I integrate over the all variable, it is equal to zero for all delta chi star, sum over i. Then the first thing that I will do is a sufficiency condition. To make it equal to 0, I will say that for each i, it is 0. For each i, if it is 0, then I do not need to write the sum. I do not need to write the sum. So, I will say this is 0 for each all arbitrary delta chi i star. Then what does it mean? This means that this will become equal to 0. I hope all of you know the, the integral that if I have x star y is 0 for all x then y is 0 and that is a that is a strict condition for the equal uh, for the 0. So, if I have if I have a very simple condition that a b is 0 for all a then b is equal to 0. This is a very strict equality. So, that is what I am going to apply actually. Eventually delta chi i star 1 and something is there which I do not care. Something is there, so that something must be 0 on the right of that delta chi i star. So, that is the reason I am doing this. Now, you may you may have problem because you may say this is only a1, b1, one electron integral, here you have two electron, but that is really not the point. I will show you that is not the point by taking one such integral. So, can I erase this now? I will come back only to that. So, let us say I take one, one term here, any one term. So, the first term. So, half is also not important, sum is also not important, but let me write this delta chi i star 1, chi j star 2, 1 by r 1, 2, chi i 1, chi j 2, d tau 1, d tau 2. So, this is my term. 
This is the first term that I'm writing. Is it up okay? So except that everything has to be taken. That's okay. It's not important. How do I how do I write it in this form? That's what I'm going to show. Remember, you have an integral over data one, data two. I first perform the integration over data two because this is a function of one. So I integrate this quantity with data two. I'm allowed to do that, right? If I integrate this quantity over data two, this will be a function of data not data one, function of one. Data one is not right. Data one is a volume. Infinitesimal volume. So this entire thing will now become function of one. Some function. I don't care what it is. So I can write this as an integral delta chi i star one function of one. And then you have a data one, which is exactly in this form. So each of the terms I can write it in this form after integrating over the coordinate two. I have a situation where something will be function of 1 which multiplies with delta chi i star 1 everywhere and gives you 0 because my delta L has to be 0 finally. And then I can interpret that whatever this something in every term I am going to collect of course plus 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 all that together is going to be 1. Is it clear? So for, from every term I have I will have this. So this f of 1 is going to be collected over this, over this, over this, over this, over this, over this, everything. And then I can say that entire thing is equal to 0. Okay. I can, I can do that collection. So let me write it down. Sum over i delta chi i star 1. And then I have some term which I just call it now x of 1 delta 1 equal to 0. That is what I am going to get. Finally, I am going to get this form. That x of 1 contains everything. This one integrated by 2, 2, 2, here, here. Here of course, there is no integration over 2. It is simply h of 1 chi i. Here it is a very simple thing. So, this is what I am going to get. You know, except that the x I am going to write in full later. Sum over i equal to 0 for each delta chi. Please note that this x is nothing to do with chi. This is x. It could be y, whatever. If you, if you don't like x, I can write y. It doesn't matter. Just to make sure that you don't get confused. Write x, y, z, whatever you want. So, this is the, this is the generic form of the equation that I will have. Except that the y, y of 1 has to be now expanded from, from that list of terms on the left hand side. Is it clear? So, how do I make it equal to 0? The two things I am going to do. One is a sufficiency condition. The sufficiency condition tells me that under summation over i, each term is individually equal to 0. So, I am going to use a sufficiency condition. And, and this is usually, of course, you can argue with that, that is this the only condition. So, I am going to say for the sufficiency condition that each delta chi i star 1 integral, of course, y of 1, beta 1 is 0 for, of course, each i, but this, I am not going to sum for each, not i, each delta chi, all values of delta chi. Please, please correct it. Because when I have a sum over i, how can it be for each i? Because that, that is nonsense. So what I mean is that for all arbitrary delta. That means I can change chi i arbitrarily to delta chi. See, what I, what I was doing, I was changing x to delta x. Remember my x square problem. Delta x can be any arbitrary change. Similarly, for each chi i, this delta chi i is arbitrary. That is what I mean. The fact that we are changing for each i, that is obvious. So, that is what I mean. So, if I, but what I am now doing a sufficiency condition is that I am not putting the sum over i. I am saying under the sum, each term is 0. If under the sum, each term is 0, of course, the sum is also equal to 0. So, that is the reason it is called sufficiency condition, but not necessary. 
because you can argue that for one eye it can be negative, another eye can be positive and it can eventually can make it zero. So this is an argument that we are not going. So we, we assume the sufficiency condition. Then I say that for each delta chi i and of course each i, now both, it is equal to zero. And then I use this a b equal to zero to say that y of one is equal to zero. Since it is for arbitrary delta chi i, for y of one is equal to zero for for whatever i it will come. So we'll have to only identify this y of one, which is the one electron function. Interestingly, this is a one electron function. The equation that I am getting from a very complicated n particle variation has now been reduced to a single particle equation. I want to tell you that I have got a one particle equation. This y obviously has one term which is h chi i. I think the first term is quite obvious to see. It starts with h of i 1 chi i of 1, right? That you can easily see because the first term is an integral delta chi i star 1 h of 1 chi i 1. And then of course the rest are all there which also includes chi. So this quantity, this function of 1 is of course a function of chi i the spin orbitals, but it is a single particle equation that is important. And we will see show that this is precisely the equation which is called the Hartley Fermi equation for spin orbitals. Of course, since it is a single particle equation, if I can get this equation in the form of an eigenvalue problem, it will become orbitals or spin orbitals. If I can get it as an eigenvalue problem, we will see how to do that. But essentially, this is the one particle Hartley Fock equation that we talk of. And many of you already know that the Fock operator acting on something, something equal to something. So, all that will come as a y of 1. I mean, something minus something equal to 0. But that, that this is the spirit of the Hartley Fock variation. Yes. Yes, of course. Yeah, I am talking about entire time. Okay. Yeah, you can, now the point is it is the sufficiency condition. So, if this is 0, conjugate is also 0. So, that is the reason I, I sorry, I probably, I, not, probably I should have mentioned that in the sufficiency. It is not only that for each i it is 0, but I am also assuming for delta L to be 0 first that this is 0. So, I have another sufficient, two sufficiency condition that this is 0. This itself is 0 is a first sufficiency condition. Because if this is 0, conjugate is automatically 0. Then the second sufficiency condition is that under the summation over i, each term is 0. Under the summation over i, each term is 0. But remember now, if you look at the second term onwards, there is a summation over i for delta chi i, but there is a summation over j. Where does that j go? that j will actually go in y of 1. That is hidden now. Because I am only talking of sum over i. I wrote the entire equation as sum over i delta chi i star into a function of 1, which I told you is an integration of the whole thing over d tau p. So, that y of 1 will now actually include function of j, sum over j. Okay? So, that has not vanished, the two summations. So, I, I, I already said this here, right here. So, I had a sum over i, sum over j. So, the sum over j will be any a performed. So, your f is now sum over j this quantity. So, when I will identify the y of 1, the sum over j will come. So, the point here I am trying to say that every entire equation I am trying to write as a delta chi i star i something integral 1 sum over i, only sum over i. So, so basically I am trying to write it in this form. This quantity will now contain the second electron, just as here, the second electron integration, d tau 2, plus all the summation over j, wherever required, wherever required. For example, the first term, of course, there is no summation over j, it is just h1 into chi i1, wherever required. So, everything will come, including the Lagrange multiplier, this summation over j. Everything will come in y of 1. So, right now, it just just a function, abstract function. It important thing to realize that because these integrations are over all d tau 2, wherever 1 and 2 coordinates are there, that integration is performed to get y of 1. 
because if I perform that integration over delta of 2, I have only a function of 1. Is it clear? So, y of 1 is a very complex function. It will include all, all uh, the, uh, the terms like h of 1, chi i 1, all summation over j, all integration over delta of 2, wherever required, wherever required. Okay. So, I think this is something that uh, we should remember for when I will do this y of 1. So, the y of 1 is something that I will try to detail in the, from the next class on. And actually, you already know how I am going to do it, so it is very easy. So, it is basically the first term of y of 1, for example, the y of 1, the first term is itself h of 1 chi i 1. That is clear. This is very trivial because that then they then when I integrate here, I get delta chi i star 1, h of 1 chi i. So, that is the first term. The second term will start, you know, I can generically show like sum over j, integral chi j star 2, I can write it right away, 1 by r 1 2 chi j 2, d tau 2, multiplied by chi i 1. Note that this chi i 1 must remain, right? The integration is over chi j 2, but this chi i 1 you cannot vanish. Because I want to write everything with only one delta chi i store on the left, everything else should remain. So, this chi i 1 will be a part of the y, y of 1 and I can keep writing like this. I have just written this chi i 1 later because I am not integrating. My first integrating of d tau 2, so I am allowed to bring this here and then write chi j, chi j 1 later. So, and then go on. In fact, we will do this uh, thing in the next class. I think he has to also go. To, you have to go now, right? Yeah. He has another video recording. So, I think we will also stop here today. So, so this is how it will happen. You know, as far as y of 1 is concerned, and this, all this together will become equal to 0, which will give you the single particle Hartree equation. Okay, is it clear? So, two, three very important things is that the Lagrange multiplier, L, no, sir, not Lagrange, L Lagrangian is Hermitian. Lagrange multiplier is also a Hermitian matrix. That is a matrix. Remember, this is a scalar. Remember, this is a scalar. This is a matrix, Hermitian matrix. Okay, and then we are using a sufficiency condition that the for each summation over i within this summation over i the entire all the terms for each i is is equal to zero. And uh, what is the other sufficiency condition that we said? Yes, ma'am. Ha. Huh, so this so for all all i it is zero, and the complex conjugate also is uh, we are not going to consider. So first is that. All the terms are going to be equal to 0 and then within this term for all each i, each term is 0. So, these are the two sufficiency conditions I am going to use so that I do not have to bring in the concept of complex conjugate. So, conjugate automatically if this is 0, the conjugate will become 0. So, that will be the first part to show. Then the second part is under the summation over i, I am going to write only summation over i. Summation over j will all be hidden in y of i. So, under the summation of i, for each i, the terms which survive are also equal to 0. The two sufficiency conditions I am going to use in deriving the Hartree configuration. Alright? So, I will stop here.